بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال سبحانه وتعالى أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين صدق الله العظيم Dear viewers, Jazakallahu khair for tuning in and joining us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Please feel free to call in and ask any questions you may have. If you know somebody, perhaps they've asked you a question in the past and you didn't know the answer to, you can send them an invite and tell them to join. We have our learned guest, we have our learned sheikh with us, Dr. Mufti Abdurrahman ibn Yusuf. So please feel free to call in and ask any question you have. Um, even if you don't have a question, I would encourage you to stay with us. Inshallah, our learned Sheikh will cover many areas, he will discuss many issues, and Inshallah Ta'ala, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will reward you for, for pursuing your knowledge, for learning, and for learning from this, Inshallah Ta'ala. Also, many people will ask, they'll, they'll call in and they'll, they'll ask many questions and inshallah, we'll all benefit from this session. So stay with us to the end, inshallah ta'ala. So we'll now turn to our Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Sheikh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa rahmatullahi wa How are Mashallah. you? Alhamdulillah, nice to be with you today. Mashallah, jazakallah khair. Um, I'm honored to be here. Alhamdulillah, inshallah, I know that I will learn a lot from you and it's, we are honored to have you. Um, in the last week, you done the show on Tuesday. Today we are doing the show on Wednesday. Eight days have gone past. See how quickly time has gone. And mm. like this, the life on this earth will just very quickly come to an end. And we're here for a purpose. So, Sheikh, just give us a nasiha in terms of how we can utilize our time more productively until we get a call, inshallah. Yeah, Allah, that's a really, really important question. Really big question. And I think... The main thing is for that what I do is I'm trying to think day by day that we're getting closer to our hereafter because when you get over the age of 40 then it's like you've gone over the hill and then it's a downhill. The Prophet ﷺ said that the age of my ummah, the age of my ummah is between um, 60 to 70. Anything beyond, seven, uh, anything beyond 70 is, is bonus. Alhamdulillah, people are living beyond 70, but that's all a bonus. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides an excuse until 60. After that, the excuses are difficult to make. And the reason for that is, by the age of 40, we become more set in our ways. After 40, it becomes difficult to change. It's not impossible to change, but it becomes difficult to change. That's why Imam Ghazali reports that at the age of 40, if a person's good has not overcome his bad, evil, meaning he's not more good than evil, then the shaitan says, okay, this is the face of somebody who's not going to succeed. Allah. So, in Islam, it, until the last breath, we have, mashallah, the doors of Toba are open for us, until the last breath. So, that's the beauty of Islam. You're never condemned until you die, right? And if you die on the wrong, then, then you could go to hellfire. But... Otherwise, you have the right to do tawbah. And generally, the 40 mark is the kind of middle of life. That's why a lot of people have midlife crisis around that time as well. They, a lot of people divorce at this time. Yes. A lot of people do crazy things at this time. But the religious person at this time becomes stronger in their faith. Because they realize that I'm over the hill now. And I'm going to look on to my death. So I need to do good things. I need to do increase good things. That means basically paying the debts that we have and paying the debts to Allah that we have if you've got qadha prayers to make then to finish them off and do them 
so that we don't have a balance on the Day of Judgment, to try to free ourselves and then trying to do as many good things <coughs> as possible, whether that be sadaqah, assisting others, more salat, zakat, uh, more salat, sadaqah, hajj, umrah, basically purely for the sake of assisting others is a big thing and trying to leave a legacy. That, that's for me the big thing. The only reason I'm doing this question answer session is because most people when they ask questions, a majority of people when they ask questions, they have a genuine question and they've got a genuine need. Yes. Yes. And if they ask the question and I'm able to respond, may Allah give us tawfiq to do it properly, Amen. I've helped somebody. And subhanAllah, you know, if you've got a bit of a little pain here or in your stomach and you don't know what it is, you've never felt it before, you, the stress is worse than that you don't know what it is, is actually worse than the pain sometimes, yes. psychological. You go to a doctor and he checks it and he says, oh, it's for this reason. Immediately the stress goes away. The mm. pain might still be there, but at least the stress is gone. Because he's diagnosed it and he's told you what this is all about. And mashallah, scholars, ulama and doctors, they have this really powerful position of making people feel good. So let's just say that you had a bit of an issue with your, uh, somebody had a bit of an issue with their wife and they said something. They don't know if it's a divorce or not. Some people have a lot of misunderstandings about this. Or somebody had a problem with their prayer or their fast or a zakat question and they don't know and they're like what is it have I broken my prayer what should I do when they ask a scholar and they respond then they feel good and they give you dua sometimes I even get a bit angry with questioners hmm. if they just bother you too much because they sometimes keep asking you the same thing in ten different ways so I remember once somebody said I was a bit upset with them and I said Sheikh I make so much dua for you I said okay no problem I calm down <laughs> And that's, I think, what keeps me going as a question. So I have a public number as well. The only reason, it's, it's quite bothersome, to be honest, to be disturbed a lot of time. But the benefit of it is that you get a lot of du'as from people to answer questions. Because you're making, somebody could be bothered for so long. There's people, they've got questions for two, three years. And then you give them a satisfactory answer with the, the tawfiq of Allah. And they're like, oh, you've relieved so much problem. SubhanAllah, there's a huge benefit in this. So... That, I'm just saying that's one of the things that you can do. Find something that you can do to get people's du'as. Do something that will be a sadaqa jariya, a continuous charity, even after you die. Yes. If I give one poor person money now, it's good. But if I give something that will then go on forever, like pay to a madrasa, pay to uh, an organization that is going to provide work forever, a waqf, an endowment, mashallah then you, even after you're gone from this world, you'll still benefit from it. Oh, Not everybody can <coughs> write a book and leave it behind. Yeah. But if you have money, you can do that. It, you can use your money. If you've got c physical capability, you can do it. Now, some people might be saying, what am I going to do? I'm just a taxi driver. What am I going to do? I'm just a housewife. What am I going to do? I'm just a solicitor. Well, y you can provide free service. You don't have to charge for every single customer. There could be a certain amount every year which you give for free, for example. A housewife, you don't know what you can do. Well, maybe you can cook for someone who needs help. You can do shopping for somebody that needs help. At the end of the day, just ask Allah. Allah, accept me for some service of your deen. Accept me for some service of your deen. There's a hadith that Imam Ahmed and um, Imam Ahmed and Ibn Hibban have narrated from a <coughs> relatively unknown Sahaba whose name is Amr ibn al Hamik. He said that, May yuridillahu bihi khayran, whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends good for, istamalahu, he uses him, he employs him, he accepts him in his service. Sahaba didn't understand exactly what istamalahu meant. He said, Ya Rasulullah, ma istamalahu. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Yuwafiquhu li amalin salihin qabla mawtihi yarda anhu man hawlahu aw yarda anhu jiranuhu. Allah will divinely enable him to do something before his death by which his surrounding people, his neighbors, etc., will be happy with him. Today, the whole world is our neighbor because it's a globalized world. 
So if Allah can allow us to do something that people will make dua for us and we've given happiness to people, subhanAllah. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh, Jazakallah khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to act upon what you said. The nasiha mm-hmm. is priceless. So, dear viewers, we're going to take a short break now. And inshallah ta'ala, please do join us in a couple of minutes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum, dear viewers, Jazakallah khair for tuning in again and please feel free to call in and ask, ask any questions you have. Um, even if you don't have any questions, please stick with us, stay with us and uh, if you know anybody who wants to ask any questions, please let them know that our learned guest, our Sheikh is here to answer any of your questions inshallah. So uh, please do not hesitate, any question you may have, anything you want clarity with. Alhamdulillah, we have a very, very learned, mashallah, lots of experience. Our Sheikh has been to many different countries, he studied with many different institutions. He has a broad understanding of faith, of Islam, of hadith. So, inshallah, whatever question you may have, um, you know, our Sheikh is going to be able to provide you with an answer, a satisfactory answer, inshallah. So, do not hesitate. Please pick up the phone and call, any, call us and ask any questions. So let's turn to our Sheikh. Sheikh, um, I've, uh, I've been asked a question um, a couple of times over the years, and when I looked into it, there were divergent views. Um, so this question relates to hijab. Um, some say that for a woman to observe hijab in her own home, around her male relatives, i.e. the mahram, um, some say it's wajib when I inquired, and some say no, it's purely cultural, it has no basis in Islam, a woman does not have to observe hijab. Of course she has to dress modestly, but in terms of you know, showing her hair and covering her head and that kind of stuff. For example, a daughter-in-law does not have to wear hijab in front of her father-in-law. Um, but of course when she goes out, that's a different issue. So can you please tell us a bit more on this please, Sheikh? Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So regarding hijab in the, uh, it is basically hijab in the home. Right, that's the discussion. Yes. So, in front of your mahrams, there's a there's a fiqhi boundary and a fiqhi restriction or a fiqhi allowance. But then in Islam, there's always, in many cases, there's two sides of the story. So, for example, in salat, the absolute basic elements of salat are, you know, standing, qira'a, etc., etc., etc. If a person had no concentration in his prayer, the salat is still done, but it's not a good salat, right? Likewise in fasting, as long as you've stayed hungry from true dawn in the morning until, um, uh, until sunset, your fasting is done, even if you sinned in between. But that's not, really a good, that's not really a very good fast, is it? Likewise, uh, in front of mahrams, the woman's hair and her face, in fact even her arms, are actually not hijab. Even more than that, actually, is not hijab. So they don't have to. The reason is that um, women may be going about their house activities and so on, and parts of the arms or the uh, neck area or the head or the feet could become exposed. So it's difficult for them to have to maintain that in their own home because there's other men there, like their father, their brother, or an uncle, for example. So it's not necessary, right? that's for sure, it's not necessary, they won't be sinful. It becomes necessary in certain circumstances, if there's a fitna then it becomes necessary. To such a degree that, and now we have many people with very weird ideas. So if a woman is fear of fitna, of temptation from her brother or her uncle or father-in-law or son-in-law or even father then you'd have to cover they can't even be in the same room so by default it's not there but in exceptional circumstances because of the fear of temptation or fear of aggression or whatever then it becomes necessary that's first thing so that's the only case where it would become necessary as far as I understand however 
There's a general recommendation to be as modest as possible, which includes the head. For example, it's related from Hassan, I think it's most likely Hassan radiallahu anhu, the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa or for sure then Hassan Basri rahimahullah, that he says to the men that if you can avoid looking at the hair of your mahrams, then do so. If you can avoid it, then <coughs> avoid it. Because the hair is part of the beauty and you don't want it that shaitan overcomes you. So it's not necessary unless there's an issue, uh, a, a fear, a temptation, a fitna. Um, or it's just better to, but it's not necessary at all. <coughs> Jazakallah khair. That's, you know, thank you very much for this beautiful answer. It's very elaborate how you basically provided the, um, you know, the whole ruling around it. I, I, and I, I wanted that clarified because when inquiries were made, some people said it's wajib and that, yeah. that didn't seem right. So yeah, in the Hanafi, this is the Hanafi school that it's not wajib. Yeah. I can see that maybe some families have it as a wajib of their family. Yeah. You know, it's not a religious wajib, but it's a, maybe a, a family wajib that in their family that's what they do. And I know of certain families that are very strict, so they have to wear hijab in the house. But that's just a family law. It's not religious. It wouldn't be sinful if they didn't do that. Okay, so I've had I've had sisters come to me and they say, look, is that fair then? Like you know, is that fair then for the father or the brothers to implement that when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given them the exemption, you know, that, and they're allowed to go about and just be yeah. Know, it's be a difficult question. Home. It's a difficult question because they shouldn't do that for no reason. Yes. Because it, in the house you need to be a bit more relaxed and yes, unless they fear something. Yeah. If they fear something, then they've got all right to do that because at the end of the day, the father would be the responsible for the tarbi of the household. But if there's no such fear and it's just imposing and just making it difficult, then it's going to make it difficult for people to sit together because then women might feel hot or whatever, then they want to stay in their own room. Then it probably creates a problem with the whole household atmosphere. Yes, if they're living, I mean, it may be that they're talking about extended households where they've got like three brothers living with their wives in the same house, small spaces, and there's a constant movement and uh, that's why they impose that you better have the hijab. I'm just making yeah. excuses that maybe that's the reasoning that they have or something. But if it's just purely mahrams, then no. Okay. Having said that though, one, nowadays, one does need to be a lot more careful with their in-laws, with their father-in-law and their son-in-law because we're hearing a lot more problems with that. So with, you see what happens in a human being it's quite amazing that Allah has made this. You know if you go into a supermarket if you're, if you're a guy who likes shopping or a woman who likes shopping then you're generally going to go through all the aisles to just check if there's something you need, right? However, there's two or three aisles that you don't have to go into. Which aisles are those in this country? For Muslims, alcohol and It's going to be the alcohol. Alhamdulillah, you don't even have to bother. You don't even feel like, hey, no. I just want to check what's on offer. I'm not going to buy there's it. No interest. There's no interest. Why? Yeah. There's a switch off. Yeah. There's no window open to that. You don't, it, you don't have to. It's like a person who doesn't smoke. right? He doesn't even have to bother with the cigarettes. Like He doesn't even have to think about it. Yes. That if I'm traveling, you know, cigarettes are cheaper and duty free. He doesn't even have to think about it. But that's the same thing. What happens is that there's generally between fathers and daughters, brothers and sisters, generally in a righteous home, by nature actually fitra, the fitra is that as beautiful as your sister may be, as beautiful as your mother or auntie may be, the switch is off. So you, you don't have an issue with that. With a stranger, you know, then you're attracted yeah. But when it comes to your close ones, you're not even attracted, unless you're messed up. You know, unless there's a deviance in the mind, then that's nothing. So, but when it comes to in-laws, because they're not your natural relatives, there's a lot of fitna in that. So one has yeah. to be, I think one should be careful in that, much more careful with that. Jazakallah khair, Jazakallah, that's a beautiful answer you've given us. So that clarifies a lot of things. Of course, there's when there's danger, when there's you know, there's danger of fitna and there's deviant, you know, it could be brother or a, or, a, or an uncle who's got this kind of 
you know, issues and has these kind of problems, then of course around them it w- it's logical our, and, our, and our religion is very logical and reasonable. Mm. Then of course in that circumstances, they, it's of course you know, wajib to cover up and take precautions. Jazakallah khair. Dear viewers, uh, please feel free to call and ask any question. If you, if you don't want to say your question in English, you can speak to me in Bengali and I will translate that, I will, I will translate that to our Mufti Sahib and, and inshallah he will answer your question for you. So, you know, don't worry if you don't want to say the question in English. Feel free to speak to me in Bengali. Jazakallah khair. So, Mufti Sahib, of course the purpose of it is you know, we discussed. Maybe there are many people just listening and benefiting from this, and you know, it's just a it's just a way for so many people to learn about Islam. And f- some people find it very interesting and they find it inspirational. So that's why I'm asking you questions because this mm-hmm. many people face these issues and many people have these questions in their mind. So um, moving on from that particular issue, this this current issue that's taking place, and I wanted to you know. Uh, get your thought on this. Um, you see, when people people start insulting the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they they make movies and write things, uh, and of course, for for us, our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is more beloved to us than our own children, and so there is this lot of you know anger and frustration when these things happen, and you know um, they some people get really violent, some people you know, take measures to their own hands. Um, and others, they say, okay, no, the, let's not give them any publicity. Let's stay home. Let's stay quiet. Let's bury it. You know, let almost like turn a blind eye to it because if we give them publicity, then that's what they want. Um, so both make, you know, in a way, if you look at it objectively, it just makes sense in the sense that some say, you know, we need to go out there and stand for what is the truth. Mm-hmm. We know, defend the honor of our Prophet ﷺ. Of course, we don't agree with violence and that kind of stuff. But you know, just going out there, knowing, show, telling everybody that look, we're not, we're not happy with this, and this is not freedom of expression. Rather, it's insulting the sentiment of millions and billions of people around the world. And others say, no, let's not give them any attention. Let's just stay quiet. Let's just, you know, turn a blind eye to it. So, Sheikh, I wanted you to just, you know, tell us a bit more about how should a Muslim go about it, and what should a Muslim do in such mm-hmm. circumstances? Because we're hearing more and more of these. So you see, um, you've, you basically highlighted two approaches in this regard, right? That go out and do something about it, maybe do a march, a protest, or whatever. The other one is sit back and do nothing and try to suffocate it in terms of don't give it any room to breathe and just let it go. Which, so to be honest, I think what we need now is a more of a strategic thinking. So whenever issues like this happen, or not when it happens, but we already know that they've happened in the past and they will probably continue to happen. Yes. It's just that this time it was from an extremist Shia group who I've heard a Shia Imam myself tell me that they don't agree with him at all. In fact, he called him a bad name. I don't want to necessarily repeat that right now, but he called him a bad name. So I was like, okay. Just like, you know, every group. Even the Sunnis, you know, we have certain people who are extreme and they'll just give us a bad name. So that's basically what's going on. But what is the response to it? It really depends. It's very difficult to say what's right and wrong. But <coughs> in some cases, a protest is definitely what is required. Especially if it's something that everybody knows about as well. Again, but the protest needs to be done in a way that it can't be used against you. So, for example... If you're going to use that protest to grind some other, uh, do something else with that and do some other attacks with that, then what happens with the whole protest is that other people say that you're... So for example, if you use this protest to say that uh, Shias are like that or Shias are like that, right? Then what they're going to do is they're going to say, oh, they're just against us, that's why they're doing that. Then the whole aspect that it's a fringe element and this is wrong and trying to get people's sympathy towards you, you lose that. What happens a lot of the time is we get angry. And when you get angry, sometimes we lose our mind in terms of being able to think strategically. I would probably think that this is what probably what the biggest problem is, that we don't always think strategically. Right? We mm-hmm. think that the answer is anger. And this worked in certain countries where the loudest, the, the loudest voice, the loudest noise basically won, you know. 
but it doesn't work in this in 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 the western context what works here is calm deliberated argument to try to get people to understand what you're saying you can't shove ideas down people's throats anymore you have to just be convincing with evidence and then lead them to make the decision and the right decision lead them to draw the same conclusion as you are for that you need a lot of tact in some cases protests are necessary and are useful and are beneficial in other cases uh, maybe suffocating it and giving it no publicity would make a better deal so in this case uh, um, in, in the recent case I'm not sure I've not been able to look at it for the last few days because I was out uh, but I, I have heard that a number of places have stopped and then the other thing is that there's all these people ready to just look at a slip up of yours of where you might say something wrong that's why one has to be just very careful that's why we probably need we need we definitely need a lot more balanced spokespeople yeah. right and until we don't get that then there's going to be others who will do it but we can't complain until we do it ourselves exactly. so that's why it's very important that we make that decision and um, unify together and develop a lot more spokespeople uh, may Allah make it easy for us Amen. I do think though on a good note that we're getting better at it compared to past events I think we're definitely much more strategic Alhamdulillah and Allah bless all of those who've tried to do something Alhamdulillah you know? Amen. Jazakallah khair much more you know great advice I, of course like you said it's a very difficult thing to deal with because we're not in a country or we're not we're no longer in in that kind of uh, environment where we can just use force and you know just be very loud and just try pushing our ideas down people's throat and you know forcefully get things done we need to be strategic we need to utilize our you know our our understanding our knowledge our our, our brain really to be very decisive and be you know work mm -hmm. together collectively and alhamdulillah many places have you know Stop they decided it. to cancel their show and that's that's great results in the long run i think what we really need to do is that we really need to lobby the parliamentarians and get them to understand that let us stop this once and for all that there needs to be a law that's passed so that this cannot happen <laughs> this is i think really the long-term goal that needs to happen because it's going to otherwise keep coming up yes and then you have to keep putting patches on there so i think this is what it is just like other groups have been able to exactly, do yes, against I mean, yeah. discrimination towards yeah. them, that they've been able to get it into law. Yes. And I think that's with cool deliberation, inshallah, that should be happening. Alhamdulillah, I think you know, there's good organizations out there that are trying to make that kind of a thing happen. And inshallah, it will. There's a lot more MPs now that listen to Muslims, yeah. uh, that they are Muslims. Alhamdulillah, yes. They're conscientious Muslims, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. And inshallah, we can just have more of that. And that just shows that we're getting somewhere, you know, yeah. after being here in 60 years or so in this country. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's a great piece of advice. You know, we need to really go and be part of the establishment and really be involved so that from there, from within, we can do it democratically. We can do it, you know, the right way. And like you said, Sheikh, you know, other, other groups, other minority groups have that. They have that kind of protection. And if they could do it, inshallah, we could do it too. Yeah, they've just worked hard to get it. Yes. Uh, sometimes there's a lot more sympathy towards them, sometimes, you know. But everybody's had to go through a struggle. And this is our struggle, inshallah, we'll get there as well. Yes. When Allah they first Allah. arrived, we, you know, when they first arrived in this country, they had to face a lot of discrimination, a lot of, a lot of you know, a lot of them were attacked and there were a lot of uh, discrimination against them and they worked their way up and inshallah we should take inspiration from that and we and we have a better cause I, we believe as Muslims right we believe that you know we have the haq and we have uh, we have Allah on our side we believe that we you know we're, we're on the correct path and if we take a step forward towards Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take two steps towards us inshallah so Sheikh would you say you know these organizations that you know many institutions that are working for the Muslim uh, for the Muslim community for example you know we got Muslim Council of Britain and other many other organizations should a Muslim really be involved you know most of us really we kind of like take a back seat we don't really get involved uh, we might not have the time we might not do you know give them contribution in terms of finance and how should a Muslim really how important is it for for Muslim I, I feel like majority of us don't have any affiliation any kind of involvement with these, uh, these yeah. organizations so look I don't, I don't think everybody can practically physically do something because that 
is not going to happen and that's not even practically possible but I think at some level every single one of us it's our responsibility as being Muslims in this country that we support organizations that are defending the rights of Muslims and campaigning for them like MEND for example yes. and there's a number of others right that are doing things at different levels if we can't physically be part of it and give our physical support then we give monetary support uh, if that's not possible, then we encourage others to do so. And along with all of that, we do dua for them. Yes, yeah, That is definitely, a, uh, the, uh, the dua is supposed to be a weapon of a believer. And that's the minimum we have to use. So that way, inshallah, we will be included in that and we'll be doing our part at least. So we need to either physically take part, uh, especially capable people, people who have studied law, activism, media and other fields that are related to this human rights, law and all of that volunteer their time, go and try to get some work uh, you know, based on it, assist them and help them send them research and then physically, uh, sorry, monetarily help them and then on top of that make dua for them at the same time we need a lot more organizations but the few we have you know, they're, they're struggling, they're trying their best, they're struggling they could do better, some of them could do better. And uh, inshallah, Allah Ta'ala give them more strength. I mean, Allahumma. I, mean, I always hear, you know, I come across their campaigns financially, they're struggling. A lot of them do tend to struggle. Uh, and of course, you know, if we, for example, give a small uh, contribution, you make a small contribution towards the organization, and if a lot of us do that, mashallah, they could do so much work. A lot of these people that work for these company, these organizations, they're doing voluntary work. So that's something you know we should be really um, staying staying in tune with because they are essentially working for us and we Absolutely. are working. We should be working together collectively as a ummah, right? So Jazakallah Khair Sheikh for, for the for the great advice and for the nasiha. We'll, viewers, we'll take a short break right now and inshallah we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, dear, um, dear viewers, for tuning in again. Um, we're having many discussions around many different topics. Um, our, our Mufti Sahib is here to answer any of your questions. Just feel free to un, uh, pick up the phone and just call in. Um, mashallah, our Sheikh has so much knowledge. Alhamdulillah, we're honored to have him. He has a lot of experience dealing with people. Uh, so don't hesitate, don't feel embarrassed, don't feel shy. Just pick up the phone and call and inshallah you will get a very good answer to any of the question, any question you may have. Viewers, if you feel shy uh, or you don't want to ask me, you don't want to ask the question in English, feel free to call in and ask the question in Bengali. I'll translate that to the Sheikh and inshallah I'll provide you an answer in Bengali as well. Um, Jazakallah khair. So, Mr. Sab, let's turn to you and let's carry on with our discussion. Dis discussion. Alhamdulillah, I'm learning so much from you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for coming and you know, giving us your time. So, you've talked about so many different topics and alhamdulillah, they're very, you know, they're quite, most of these are very common uh, problems people are facing mm -hmm. or many you know, questions that people are having. Um, so moving on from that, and but in a way it's kind of connected to that. So what's, what I'm seeing with regards to social media and you know social networking sites, you've got, you've got uh, apps like TikTok and Instagram, Snapchat. Uh, what ha what's happening is that a lot of our youth, they are putting, um, they start off probably with good intention, but then it just kind of changes and then there's a lot of material out there and it's like they're competing with one another to just get more viewers and more followers and subhanallah it's a shame because it could be that parents are thinking their children are upstairs in their bedroom doing no harm but in their bedrooms they could be subhanallah committing major major sins and leaving materials out there that could be very very harmful to them and even after they are dead that, that material is there am I not correct Sheikh? Like that material could be there for many, maybe hundreds of years, right? And we could be in our graves whilst 
uh, you know, this is long gone, hundreds of years later, we could still be committing sins. So, Sheikh, I want you to please provide us, you know, be, you know give us an answer or give us some nasiha around that. What can, what can, you know, parents do? What can older brothers or older siblings or, you know, mom and moms and dad, uncles, what can they do, the guardians? parents, guardians, what can we do to ensure that our children are not falling, in, falling into this trap because it's like a trend now for you to have, a, have an account and for you to go out there and if you don't have many followers if you don't have many followers then you know, you're, you're, you're nobody in society mm -hmm. we'll come back to that inshallah, we have a caller <coughs> Salaamu Alaikum caller Wa Alaikum Salaam যে আমার একটা প্রশ্ন হইল আমার একজন বোন মারা গেছে একসাথ হয়েছে তখন সানডে তো যখন হোমন বদি মাটি লই গেছে এখন সান কিছু নমাজ হাতক আকি আমার জানা মতো আকি তাই পড়তা না আজে মাঝে গেপ দিতা এখন তাই নে আমেরিকা তখন পুরা পুরি জানিও না তার বয়স হইল প্রান্তিবি আচ্ছা <laughs> আমি চিন্তা করবাম আমার ফ্যামিলি আসেন কিছু দিনদার আলিম হাফি যখন তো এই যেখানো আর আমি <laughs> ইনশাল্লাহ আমরা শেখ সাহেবে আপনার কোয়েশনের আনসার দিবা আমি বাংলায় বুঝাই দিব ইনশাল্লাহ আপনার জাজাকাল্লাহ খাইর ফর ইয়ার কল আসসালামু আলাইকুম ওকে শেখ সো ইটস কোয়াইট এ স্যাড স্টোরি রিয়েলি দ্য সিস্টার জাস্ট কলড শি সেড শি হ্যাজ এ সিস্টার দ্যাট লিভড ইন আমেরিকা ইন দ্য ইউএস সামওয়ে ইউ ইউ নো ইওর ফ্যামিলিয়ার উইথ অফ কোর্স এন্ড শি ওয়াজ অনলি 23 ইয়ার্স অফ এজ আনফর্চুনেটলি she was murdered by her husband and she went to um, an environment she was living in an environment where islam wasn't prevalent islam wasn't really practiced it was in that kind of an environment so the sister is of the impression that she didn't really pray her salah uh, she was not a person she would play, pray here and there now she's gone to uh, I, i think she's buried in she, her body was returned to bangladesh where she's buried so um, the caller was asking what can they do i mean she understands that you know missing sola is a major sin but now she's gone and she was young of course they they feel they're worried and they're concerned about the about her sister so what can she do in order to perhaps uh, you know compensate for some of the things you know some of the sola she missed is there anything she can do to make sure that you know to help her mm. in in the, in the hereafter is there anything she can do please please give us uh, advice on that Yeah, that's a sad story, but the great thing is that at least you've got somebody who cares for her. Now the fact that she's dead and she's gone, well, the beautiful thing is that there's somebody who cares for her, mashallah. You know, I wish we had people who would care for us as well like that. After we die, inshallah, we will. So what she can do now is that she can, she can try to make an estimate of how many prayers she may have missed. It'll be difficult, I think. But whatever number. And then she can just give that much amount of fidya for each missed prayer generally if the person who's who's dying or dead if they haven't made a bequest that i want somebody to pay then 
whether Allah accepts it or not, that's always going to be up to Allah, right? However, they say that if there is somebody who would want on behalf of their parents or somebody else, even though their parents did not say, do hajj for me or pay this uh, fidya and expiations for me, they're saying that, inshallah, it could be accepted. At least it's a good idea to do that. So I think what she can do now is she can do a lot of dua for her, give a lot of sadaqa on her behalf and try to figure out how many salat and fasting etc. she may have missed and then give fidya for that as well. So inshallah Allah will accept and make dua for her because the duas of people we leave behind definitely benefits. That's the hadith mentions that very clearly and other rewards as well, sadaqa, hajj etc. So that's what we can do. There's a, for those who of you who speak English, there's a book called What the Living Can Do for the Dead. What the Living Can Do for the Dead. It's actually written by uh, Dr. Shahrul. Um, Shahrul Hussein, uh, mashallah, uh, from Birmingham, our brother from Birmingham. Oh, he's my ustad, mashallah. He's your teacher, yeah. mashallah. So it's a good book. It's called, uh, you can get it from whitethreadpress.com, whitethreadpress.com. And he's done a good job in there of trying to explain what you can do for people who've died and what you shouldn't do that culturally people might want to do. So that's what I would say. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive her. And Amen. may Allah give this uh, sister a lot of sabr. And beautiful patience. I mean, Allah, Sh- Sheikh. Uh, before I pr- um, provide provide the answer in Bengali, I translate that into Beng- Bengali. Um, so, f- for a person who is murdered, there should be some sort of, you know, some people may take solace knowing that this person was murdered because in the Hadith we hear that, right? Uh, you know, when a person is murdered, their sins and is taken by the murderer. Yeah, it's a, I don't know the exact admit. circumstances, but in there's about 60 to 70 circumstances in which a person dying of unnatural causes could be considered a shaheed. Subhanallah. So Allah knows best that we can't make judgments, but um, you know that's a possibility. That Allah will have mercy on her. I mean, I mean. Okay, we were after the question also, and I mean after question, to um, Sheikh Sabe answer also, and to quickly, how you delay. So, Sheikh Sabe, how is it? After the, inshallah, you know, after the two hours, the first, firstly, after the, after the Maya hour, after the Tanu Khuda Sinta hour, Tanu Khuda Mono hour, Alhamdulillah, after Tan, after Tan, Tan, after lucky person, at least the Tanu Moral for the Tanu Maya Fir Man Shaykh, Tanu Khuda Sinta hour, or Beshi beshi khuri dua khur ba. Fne beshi beshi tanu khur dua khur ba. Allah tan de maaf khuri dita. Allah tan de tanu qabr or zibon de izi khuri dita. Beshi dua khur ba. Afne tanu nigr sadaqa khur tafar ba. So bichoni afne tanu tanu name tanu 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 khur tam mindu rakia afne gore bolar khawai tafar ba. Oto bagore bolar findi tafar ba. Sadaqa khur tafar ba. Madrasat tafar ba. Musudin tafar ba. Aar afne zin faroin. Tehtemni estimate khor baze khoto namaz ta in mis khor zon ta nor baliga war for many from that time ta in zon baliga zon till now khoto ta emne mis namaz mis khor zon emne zin estimate khor ya zin zin faroin te ola ekhtem estimate khor ya inshallah fidia di tafarba ar inshallah Allah amra amra doa khor ya Allah ta nor fre is razi o izen ta nor maaf khor ya Allah nor ta nor khobar or the journey as it like easy for it in easy for it in I mean Allahumma amin so viewers please um, feel free if you have if you have any more questions like this uh, caller they asked the question in Bengali I was able to translate that to our Sheikh Sab in English and he provided the answer and I was again able to translate that uh, answer into Bengali and Alhamdulillah we, we were all benefiting from that so if even if you don't have a question Please stay tuned and uh, we will we'll, we'll benefit. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward us for this time we're spending in pursuit of our of, our, of knowledge. Uh, the, our Mufti Sahib is discussing about various matters, very, very important uh, topic he's, he's uh, discussing. So, mashallah, we're going to, uh, you know, when we die, we'll, we'll see lots of reward, inshallah sure. ta'ala. Okay, uh, we have another caller. Uh, caller, Salaamu Alaikum. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam. Please, uh, please. Wa alaikum as salam. What's your question? Question, you know, Zul, I'm going to get out of the top, brother. Is it, maybe, no matter what you may have not found, is it, tent as a pulpit? Joy. Tent, contact with it, 
What's the ruling regarding that and, and in terms of sins, how, how, how big is the sin and he just wants to know more about this particular uh, topic. You mean, if, the, if, you're, if you're trying to keep your trousers up and people know how, should know how to keep their trousers up by now. <laughs> so, in the sense that yes. if you, it's like hijab keeps rolling down and keep pushing it up. But there's ways of putting a hijab on that it doesn't. Likewise, there's ways of keeping trousers on that they shouldn't. So yes. if they're loose, then get a belt. Or if you've got a, a cord, then tight, tighter. If you've done your best and then it falls down and you can't push it up, then inshallah y you should be forgiven because Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, his trouser fell down, Prophet said, it's okay. You oh, don't subhanallah. do it uh, you know, for the wrong reason or whatever. And he had some I excuse, I think, due to which it had fallen down. So it really depends on why it's falling down. and So if it's an inadvertent thing that has just fallen down, inshallah, that could be forgiven. Raising the trousers just for salat has got nothing to do with salat. Really. It's not in any of the books that in salat make sure your trousers are above. That should be always the case. Oh. That is the way the Prophet Sallallahu had it. He, Prophet Sallallahu always had his trousers up and not down. So that, that's a normal thing. I think the reason why people think that they should do it in Salat is, you know, I want my Salat to be accepted. I don't want to be sinning while I'm in Salat. So that's why they put it up and then they go out and then they start putting it down again. So that's a separate issue. Now, there are different views about how bad the sin is of uh, the trousers being below the ankle. Some people consider it to be prohibitively disliked and uh, sinful. Others say that it's lightly disliked. Um, personally, the way I look at it is that the Prophet never had it uh, lower. That was always it was always up, and that is what the encouragement should be. So I always try to keep my trousers up. Um, so, as I said, you shouldn't in in salat. It's it's a good idea to put it up. You know, at least you should try to keep it up all the time, really. Inshallah, Allah make it easy. Amen, Allah. Jazakallah khair for the answer. Beautiful answer once again. So, Kola, after question to Asil Zayami, Tisabrizika Horsi, Taina, beautiful Horia answered the design. The Avnar Amra Munurahtam, the Amrar Gontar Amra Ankulur Ufre, Amrar Hafor Shoshmurahtam, Halinomazola Giazekta, Halihortamar, Bade Amra, Ita Sinta Hortana, Ita Ila Hortana, the Amra Shopshumoi, Amrar. Hafor ankular ufre gontar ufre rahtam. Ar jodin fori jay accidentally inshallah tejto to Allah maaf korba kuchh hoy tonai. Ar ar tan khosan jay kono kono ulama khle khosan ikta makru tahrimi khosan khosan makru. But amra nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam shob shomay tan gontar ufre hafota rahsan. To amra try khosan shob shomay hafota gontar ufre rahtam inshallah Allah amra taufiq dakka. Jazak Allah khair. Next caller. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Ami ekta question khosan parmani. Jaya khorka. Yes, our husband is not a good thing to do with the Nisha, no matter how much he is, but he is not a good thing to do with the Nisha. He is not a good thing to do with the Nisha. He is not a good thing to do with the Nisha. He is not a good thing to do with the Nisha. Do you want to do the Nisha? Yes, I do. Do you want to do the Nisha? Yes, I do. Do you want to do the Nisha? Yes, I do. Do you want to do the Nisha? Yes, I do. Do you want to do the Nisha? Oh, jaman awak tanam nak dulu lekak Alzheimer zaman kau ikhlas na dimensi ikhlas. Ya, dia dimensi aku ya. Zaman aku korsoi. Ya. Zaman kisah khusus itu balal. Jadi, mana yang fonda besar dari ni ni tanor memori kesi, fulta si minyak, ba dah zaman ni aku ulah besar. Fulta ni yang dek kita kotor. Makan tak question saya kerja ni juga kerja. Okay, tiga saya. Afnar question time dua dia tu lmu. Amra syak sabri. An insya Allah. Tanya answer dia lain. Afnar mihbar Bengali kau insya Allah. Syak, this is a very, very, very important question the sister asked. 
probably an aunt. Um, um, her husband has been suffering from dementia for the last 15 years. And prior to that, he was a namazi, he would pray salah. And for the last 15 years, he doesn't recognize his children, he doesn't recognize his mm -hmm. family. And of course, that means, of course, he doesn't have the, 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 the mental mind and capacity mental capacity to, to yeah. remember and, and pray. So this is, you know, as we're aging, may Allah subhanahu wa protect us. It's, it's possible that, so, you know, there are many people who are like that. So what's the Islamic ruling regarding such person? They're not obligated to pray because they don't have aql. So they don't have a rational faculty and namaz and salat is only wajib on those who have aql. So they're not obligated to pray. Uh, a lot of the time if they... Uh, some people are not in dementia all the time. They are intermittent dementia. So sometimes they're... And so, on. so when they're not, then they can pray. Or you can encourage them to pray. But there's no point forcing these people to pray. Mm. Don't think they're children that you have to force them to pray because it's not even obligatory on them. They're towards the end of their life. But those who are intermittent, then they just need a bit of encouragement or a bit of assistance. Then you can assist them and help them. And if they just completely don't understand anything and it's very difficult to get them to pray, then you're not obliged to make them pray. Right? So uh, I don't know the exact situation of this person. If I knew, then we would have given a more specific answer. But that's basically okay. what it is. Jazakallah khair. So caller, if you question or answer, I'm going to ask you 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 to ইকটা <laughs> Dear viewers, Jazakallah Khair for tuning in and we're going to take a short break now and inshallah we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Oh, okay, so Jazak, oh, mashallah, sorry, um, uh, um, sorry, um, we're not taking a break. Uh, we're actually finishing the program now. Um, uh, Alhamdulillah, it's almost 10.30. Uh, Jazakallah Khair for uh, joining us and, and uh, calling in and tuning in. Okay, so before we do that, before we uh, finish our, conclude our program today, we're, we're going to ask uh, our Sheikh to give us the last nasiha, la, make some uh, last remarks. Yeah, mashallah, it looks like uh, I'm going to have to learn Bangla so that we can uh, understand the questions directly, mashallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless everybody and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept these shows and allow them to be used uh, beneficially and usefully. And please uh, just request that keep us all in your du'as. Uh, please pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us and the entire Muslim Ummah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So viewers, inshallah we will see you next Wednesday at 9 p.m. Please spread the word, tell others if they, are, if they have any questions and tune in and we'll have this program regularly and I'm going to be your host from today inshallah ta'ala and uh, till next time, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you blessed, keep you safe and keep us in the dua. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.